You're listening to Tech Nest, the Prop Tech Podcast. In each episode, you'll hear from Prop Tech founders, investors, and industry veterans on how they're using tech to change the way we buy, sell, and invest in real estate. Discover market opportunities, interesting data, growth tactics, and trends driving the industry forward. This isn't just another podcast about making money in real estate. This is about how we live. And now your host, Nate Smoyer. Hey, Corey, welcome to the show. Nate, thanks for having me, man. All right, I didn't tell you this in the pre-show. I live on Telluride. That's the name of my street. I think that's uh, my whole neighborhood is Colorado themed. Every my street wife grew up in, in the actual Telluride. Bam. So, in good company. There it is. I, I, I actually really like the street because I like to think it was like, you can tell I ride. I was like trying to think of like good word puns like that. Tell your ride. Worked. Got it. Tell All you right. ride. I can tell you I'm ride. Ready. Yeah. All right. We got to. Telluride is my favorite gotta... place in Colorado, which that's where I was born. In I haven't place, been there but, yet. Um, I'll, I'll get there. I love Tell You Ride. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show here. I've got Corey Sylvester. Uh, he's co-founded a, a company that is very well known in the storage space. And you've probably heard of it as well if you're, you're not even in storage. Radius Plus bootstrap that we're going to talk about that company here uh as well as uh he's actively building a massive self-storage portfolio uh and la the last count i had on your your linkedin was over half a billion in assets under management is that still accurate they're uh, under construction but yeah if you if you were to uh if you were to consider those completed and what they're worth and that's that's what that's what we're targeting <sighs> All right, so the obvious question I'm going to I'm going to start off with we're going to start high level. Which is harder, building a massive portfolio of self-storage properties or a tech company? It's a trick question. Uh they're both um I mean the the tech company is way more binary, right? Within the scope of building a tech company like there's so many more variables that are uh can lead to like a fatal error uh, in my mind versus, you know, in, in building real estate, you, I feel like you can control for those much more. Uh, they've both been incredibly difficult. Um, but, uh, you know, I think uh, the tech company, if I had to say one, it would be the tech company. The tech company was more difficult for sure. Now, um, I have openly admitted, so you know, you're on the Prop Tech podcast. That would you would assume that I know then what it means to be Prop Tech, but I don't anymore because it seems to have blurred so many lines. And one of the things I've noticed is that there's this blurring of technical solutions and then traditional businesses like maintaining properties, owning properties, service based businesses. Why not just make what you're doing here? You got two separate companies. Why not make them one? That seems to be the thing in prop tech. Well, I'm becoming a, I would be competing directly to, to make them one. I mean, look, it's, it's not a bad idea, but the question becomes, you know, what direct synergies are there? And I guess mm -hmm. the way that I think about that question, right? So we created a, the kind of the baseline data sets and a platform that people in the storage industry use to analyze, should I build a new one here? Should I buy this existing one? Like what's going on in the market? The REITs use our data to, to help inform their um, revenue management algorithms. And, uh, you know, thinking through the storage side of the business where I'm actually building self-storage facilities 
I yielded a lot of intelligence and know-how through building that company, but I wouldn't say that the direct synergies of combining them would be as accretive uh, as you would think in order to justify that. If that makes sense. Because, um, you know, I'm using data that's available uh, from Radius that people could buy, but I'm applying it in a way that not a lot of people are applying it. Mm. So, um, and if it, if it was just straight up like Radius merged with DXD, there are conflicts around, you know, I think that they're more emotional for our customers, but customers get upset. Like, you're building self storage. Like, are you tracking what I'm doing in radius? It's like, well, you turn around and ask them, like, tell me how that would work. Um, because it doesn't make a lot of sense. If you already know about a property that's under sale, like, am I watching, you know, where you're clicking and then trying to call the broker ahead of you? Like that, that's not a structural way to, to build a successful business. But the point being is that you get a lot of paranoia of mm-hmm. customers, mm-hmm. you know, that are upset that you're competing with them, which is, not necessarily a reason not to do it, but it's a frictional point that you want to consider. So like putting them into a single combination, like I guess the answer is I don't think that there's enough synergies to where, um, you know, that makes, you know, enough sense to, to do it. Yeah. No, I appreciate you, you breaking that down here. Um, and, and obviously it's not one-to-one as like a, uh, you know, the, the companies that are building their own algorithms and, to to know where to buy or what to invest in they're not they're not selling that they're maintaining that that's part of their internal operations and so then it makes sense in this case it's a little bit different because you're already selling you know the radius platform to you know access to that to other people and then to compete directly within the platform i totally understand what you're saying there now as a as a as a a founder multiple times here though uh and you mentioned that the, the software business has been harder if you had a chance to go back and restart, would you still do it in the same order? And uh, or is there anything else that you would change about how you went about it? The the tricky part about that question is that uh, building the self storage, like the the market to sell self storage data, like maybe is a ten million dollar a year market. So like we did not have a proper grasp of what the opportunity was when we started radius plus. Mm. And quite honestly, if, because it was me and two other partners, if we knew that that definitively was the opportunity, whether I would have done it or not is irrelevant because I know my other two partners would not have done it. Like it's, it's, it's difficult to think about if you know it in advance of like tackling something that was so intensive to, you know, centralize a completely defragmented market within the scope of like creating centralized Mm -hmm. data sets and everything that's involved with that to think that all that work and the risk associated with like bringing a brand new product to market that's never really existed before. And the risk associated with that, um, you know, the, the, the best thing about, um, you know, the, the, the most valuable thing to certain uh, entrepreneurs in the beginning is the ignorance associated with the problem that they're tackling and perhaps the upside associated with it. So in, in this case, case, ignorance was bliss. <laughs> yeah, because like, okay, you factor in, you know, DXD and, you know, we started uh, another property tech company uh, managed space which is building the property management software and so there have mm. been shoots that it's like it's definitely created a lot of value off of it and there are other angles to go about it but in isolation like it, it's really difficult to think about all right we're going to start this we're going to only go after this market it's only this big but then we're going to build this development company and we're going to do all like that's not the way you think in the beginning so the the best the uh, you know we had the luxury of, of not really knowing what the uh, upside was. Um, and uh, I'd say that, you know, it, it'd be difficult to tackle it with how 
it was a lot of hand-to-hand combat creating these data sets. Like there was a lot mm-hmm. of tech involved in terms of like creating the efficiencies around. We only want to look at a certain facility for a certain number of seconds because there's so many to look at and to map all the buildings and how to do that efficiently. But like it was several years of like very intensive data validation and uh, unknown, uh, you know, not knowing whether there was going to be gold at, at the end of the rainbow, so to speak. And a lot of cash you burn along the way. So it's like, I don't know. I don't when you guys bootstrapped it yet. It wasn't like you were just kind of like floating on equity investments along the way. Like you, you, you bootstrapped the company. So that's got even the sting of literal cash burn has got to be even more intense. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Like we generated the cash because we got into the business in a kind of a weird way in that we were stock analysts, essentially. We came from the buy side, which means we were investing in technology companies and we created uh, a platform and the the thesis of like starting the business was let's advise hedge funds on on big ideas that we find and we will prove them and use a tech platform to show them the data that proves our thesis is correct hmm. self storage happened to just be the first um, thesis we came across in two thousand and sixteen It was overbuilt, and the thesis was you should short it now because all the supply is coming to market. There was a ton of supply that was about ready to hit we started scraping all the REIT data, which was, you know, it's only four websites you have to scrape. So it was essentially pretty easy to get that up and running quickly. Uh, And it just kind of snowballed into this thing. So the point being is that that's where we made all our money in the beginning, like not actually shorting the stocks, but we advised some very large hedge funds and they paid us a lot of fees, seven figure business overnight. So we had this cash, uh, this, this, you know, this uh, cash coffin or coffer rather coffer for the cash however you want to say it and that's what we use to basically um you know uh, float us while we were doing this Got so it. but we were you know we've been taking for the first five years i mean we were taking salaries that uh i won't speak for my partners but for me you know i was burning cash every single year so it was incredibly painful but that's what you have to do like that's the reality of what bootstrapping is to some people i wasn't in a great financial spot to bootstrap but i didn't have a choice so Mm. i got really good at credit card balance transfers i've played that game where you you kind of you You learn where really good you can get really good you can i once uh one of my favorite stories of of myself playing those games is that uh i had a had a car i was out of college and I, i was not doing so good. Same it was my first business venture, and my car crapped out on me. No, no, it wasn't that my car. Cra- I got pulled over because my my registration was expired. The officer gets to my window and he says, "Do you know why I pulled you over?" I said, "Well, it's probably the broken rearview mirror, or that my ex- my registrations are expired, or that my car's not inspected." And <laughs> kind of chuckled, and I was like, "I said, look, honestly, I was like, rent or a car." And you know, I give him my information. He says, "Look, here's the problem: your license is expired as well." So. <laughs> He's like, you're going to have a friend come home, come pick you up. So I had to sell that car to pay the fines because I, I couldn't afford the fines for he like racked up everything. And then like savings grace, I got a Disney credit card offer in the mail, $1,300 cash advance, zero APR for 18 months. And I went, and you sure as heck, I bought a Toyota Corolla for 1300 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, c- I get city it. cards. The ba- city cards, the bank to use. They are very generous with balance transfers, and you can pay it off right before it's supposed to jack back up. They, you know, not right now. There's not a lot of offers out there. Uh, not that I'm looking anymore, but like just with how bad the bank industry is. But yeah, so that that's that's the reality of like how difficult to get. I just had my first son when we started this thing. Like mm. that's bootstrapping. We're we'll, uh, we'll gonna talk about this in my a lot. World. We don't talk about this a lot on the show of like that early stage, and there are, there, I mean, prop tech still is is budding in that like there's a lot of interesting ideas, new takes on common problems, and you know it's for me it's very exciting to see, and I, I'm excited for it. But invariably, like right now, this is a tough environment, and most are going the route of raising venture capital, so it's going to be even tougher if that's your you know what you're relying on to get your business up and going. Yeah. For the founders that are listening and, and kind of thinking about like where they're at, maybe they're playing the credit card games too, but there's tactically 
try to, you know, trade your balances around and find low interest. But then there's mentally on how to get through that. What was some of the the ways in which you were having to like evaluate and keep perspective as an early stage founder, bootstrap in the business when you really weren't able to take much of salary and you're, you know, burning uh, annually from it? One of the things that when you're in early stage is the the turn is always 18 months away. Uh, mm. And you've got this idea in your head that kind of this carrot in your mind that keeps you alive around, well, if we just do this, this is what's going to happen and things will turn. The reality of it is my experience is that expenses always go up and you never see that turn because there's always something more you can be investing in. Uh, I had a wife that was working. Um at the time, yeah, she was she was working, and she's still working now, which has been an incredible benefit. Like, obviously, you don't get married just to support a start startup, but um, how I maintain perspective, it was really tough. I mean, it's scary in those moments. It can be really scary in those moments. Um, you know, you you just you, it'll test you enough to where it makes you think through like whether you really believe in what it is that you're doing. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of people are bad. I would say that some people are bad about um, having blind faith and not understanding when to cut the cord, because there is an element of like, there were times when it got close and you have to know when, you know, you've, you've had your shot, but you know uh, it's, it's, I don't have an answer for you there. It's it's just, it's really difficult, but um, you know, if you can find other founders, I didn't have any, like I know I had my other partners and that was helpful. If you're alone, that's really difficult and you got to find mm. other people to talk to. Uh, and there's plenty of communities. I feel like you can, you can find your way into, but generally the startup world and being a founder, the, at least in my experience, like I, I'm not surrounded by founders here. Like all my kids, parents, uh, have W2s and I live in a nice area and they all have solid W2s. So we stick out like a sore thumb and that we still run our home, you know, and, uh, and, uh, you know, my wife works and a lot of the wives in my areas, you know, don't really work. So it, it, you have to find the community. I think that that can, you know, allow you to decompress because if you keep that all in your head, it can be a pretty toxic dynamic. Hmm. I think that's, that's pretty solid advice there. I mean, you got to find some community to talk to. I think that's really good and appreciate you sharing that. I, I want to shift a little bit. DXD capital, a little bit of a different company. Obviously you're working with real hard assets and this company you decided to build raising equity. Why change? Why not bootstrap uh, the real estate business? Well, it, it's the dynamic of how real estate works in that we bootstrapped. Well, I raised some small notes from friends to start the management company, which is like when you build a self-storage facility, you get fees to help you with the overhead and all those fees go up to this management company. I, we, you know, I got some small loans in order to, uh, in order to build that. But to build a $15 million asset, the way it works is like you'll contribute a certain percentage of the money needed and you'll go out and raise money for that individual project from other people or LPs. And so the business itself is essentially still bootstrapped. The projects mm-hmm. that we're building, you know, they're, we're building, uh, we've raised $150 million of equity. So you could, you could, you know, build a project yourself once you've compiled $5 million in the bank. But you, in order to get uh, there 20 years quicker, because it's going to take a long time to get $5 million in the bank, you raise that capital, you put in, you contribute, you know, two to 5% of the equity. And that mm-hmm. way you get leverage on the ability to actually uh, build, lease up and sell those assets. So it's, it's, a, it's a real estate compound. A concept, a little nuance to it, but um, yeah, just the just the real estate has outside capital. Yeah, and, and let's kind of back up a little bit and talk uh, a little bit more macro. 
um, you know, you have a real unique vantage point is like you are actually in the trenches, but you're also kind of like playing, you know, you have the ability to play analyst role, looking at things across different markets um, in the shortest way possible. What in the world's happening in storage right now <laughs> that yeah. people should know because it, it, it's been all the hype on Twitter. It, I know. You know, the last few years, <laughs> obviously, shout out Nick Huber. You know, he's going to get a mention here of like leading that AJ Osborne. I'm sure his book is behind me on my shelf somewhere. You know, yeah. there's been a handful of names that have really driven home. Like this is an amazing asset and have gotten a ton of shine. Is it? Is it still the shiny object? So if we back up like 20,000 feet, uh, you know, people... In the United States, this is largely United States phenomenon. I mean, you've got the UK, you've got Australia, you've got Canada. They each use it, but the US is predominantly like the biggest consumer of this type of, of service. Um, you know, you move, your parents die, you get divorced, you downsize, you're a plumber, you need uh, space for your equipment. The thing about storage is that there's a million different reasons why people use it. And that's why it tends to be a very uh, profitable and safe way to build a business is because the demand is so diversified. Um, each year, more and more people are using storage. So, you know, it used to be 7% of the population. Now it's up to 11 or 12% of the population. So that's wow. incredible, like secular growth on more and more people are understanding what's going on, that, that the product exists. It's much mm -hmm. more in your face these days, finding mm -hmm. the internet. So more and more people are using self-storage every year. Uh, and, you know, there's also, um, it, it's not a difficult product to build. So it tends to go through boom bust cycles in certain areas. Certain areas don't allow it very easily. So those are the areas that we try and focus on where you have to get, you know, certain entitlements. But what's going on is that, you know, you had prices go up 60 to 80% during COVID for how much you could charge, charge for storage. Um, they've come down 20% or so. So there's been a, a mm. cooling from the peak, but we're still at, you know, prior to the pandemic, like uh, still near all time highs in terms of where prices are that people are paying for storage. Um, you know, the banks right now with the S SVB thing that, that occurred. Mm -hmm. and, office market which is in shambles has put banks in a very bad position and not a lot of banks are lending so it's like the fundamentals and storage are pretty good not a lot of banks are lending which means no new product uh or very little product is going to be built from here and if demand keeps going up and supply is constrained like the market should continue to do well from the perspective of an investor from the perspective mm -hmm. of a consumer you know if, if, you know, more and more people are flying every year, but there aren't any more planes that are being added to the system, like That's ticket tougher. prices are going up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have a small, I have a small storage facility in, in the, the big metropolis of Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have so, one. Yeah. Yeah. So you're a storage um, owner yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a little guy. And um, it's very specialized and only, I only have one product. So uh, it makes my life easy and it's how I can manage remotely. But I get the calls and, and they come through my Google vo voice number. So I know what the call is and I, I still answer the phone. I will answer the phone like four out of five times usually. Um, but man, there's a lot of people looking and I, and I feel bad every time. I'm like, I'm sorry. I was like, you can call Acme up the road. There's a literal Acme storage. There's probably one in every town. Uh, and I tell them, go to, go to uh, what's it called? Uh, Sparefoot. And I was like, but I Find honestly, a I was like, spot. Yeah. I was like, I don't know what to tell you because, and they're like, no one will, literally people complain to me all the time. I can't get a hold of anyone. Yep. And I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, that, you know, you, you listen to Nick Huber and what he says, like for, for someone, you know, entrepreneurship in the U S he talks a lot about this. It, it's easier and probably more profitable, to be honest, to start a business where that's a predominant uh, phenomenon. Be a you know a plumbing service, a lawn lawn service, like pest control, where 
the bar is so low, it's a common service where all you're trying to do is uh, answer the phone and get back to people. Mm. Like that's quite frankly, thinking about what we did on the radius side, a lot easier way to build a business to break into something that a service that people have to use versus trying to sell something, you know, brand new to the market and just offer better customer service. Like that's the, that's the bar is that low. Like but, that could be um, the brand. That is the branding early on is just the fact that you answer every email, pick up the phone, follow up. Did everything work out? Do you need anything else? A hundred percent. Let me ask you a question. Are you a hundred percent occupied in a self storage facility? Sadly, yes. Constantly all year round. So it means you're not raising rates enough. Just don't. Come on. I wasn't here for. <laughs> I knew where you're going with that question. You're absolutely <laughs> correct. You're absolutely correct. All right. We can talk about that later. <laughs> so I didn't, that's why I said, sadly, you're, you're correct. Yeah. Um, let, let's talk about um, some of the traps in, yeah. in this industry. Okay. And there's a handful of things happening right now, right? You, you talked about lack of financing and that's, yeah. that's good, right? It's going to keep some new products from coming online. It should in, yeah. in theory, raise the value of existing products, but the cost of capital is higher and buyers are underwriting that into their deals. So they don't want to pay the, you know, a higher price. So we're seeing some you know, fluctuation in, in cap rates um, and moving has declined. We're seeing this year, we're we're likely to see 4.2 million residential real estate transactions. A historical average is five and a half million. That's a hell of a lot less moving. I don't know the rental moving stats here. So maybe it's getting made up for on the rental side, but that's a lot less moving happening. So what are some of the, uh, given those macro conditions, the things that are happening around the industry, what are some other traps that investors and even maybe some startups trying to create some new tech or data platforms or management platforms in the space. What do they need to be looking out for right now in the storage industry? Specifically in the storage industry. Um, like, look, whether, whether, you know, new home sales or existing home sales have fallen by 10 or 20%. Like if you can create a, uh, value saving product for the industry that that demand is going to exist regardless of what's going on with the demand uh, within the industry. What, what do you mean uh, by value of, saving? So like right now, if, if you can, you know, the property, the uh, property, uh, property management business, uh, property management software business, Storable and um, your facility probably runs on SiteLink or easy storage solutions. Easy. They um, matched the, uh, they actually beat Storable uh, prices. I, I, I shopped them. They, they are owned by Storable now. Or was it, maybe it wasn't Storable. It was one of them. It was uh, another one. The reporting in that product is very poor. Um, <laughs> you know, the there are a lot of elements to that that make it more difficult to you know, create as much value as you could otherwise. Do you know what and, it reminds me of? You know, what's that? I, I, at one point I was a real estate agent. It reminds me of using the MLS. Yeah, it's, it's, it's clunky, but it was always just supposed to be the lowest cost product. Um, you know, easy storage solutions kind of sounds that way. If you're using modern AWS infrastructure and you're starting with a clean sheet like we did, the bar is so low to create a product that works so much better. Um, and, you know, really the biggest friction that you've got within the storage industry, if you're creating products for the storage industry is like whether or not there's a lot of friction as it relates to the cost, your customers to switching to you. Cause like property management software, there's, there's a fair amount of friction. Like they don't want to mm-hmm. take it off. They got to get the cust- credit cards all back in there. Like it's a bit of a mess. Um, I don't know if I answered the question, but you know, um, there's nothing that's going on on the demand level that I would say directly impacts. Like if you're a prop tech startup in self storage, like the industry, if you zoom out is in secular growth and there's a lot of things going on that are supportive. If you've got something that, uh, can create a lot of value, then, um, you know, I wouldn't worry about the near-term macro. 
Gotcha. Uh, this is the uh, obviously like one of the things I like to focus on is uh, in this show is like the intersection of tech and real estate. And I know we've been kind of talking a little bit directly towards, you know, founders and thinking about like what other founders can be learning from your experience and what you've done. But on the tactical level, let's just suppose I'm a storage owner. I am, but let's say I've got a like nice facility. I've got, I got some small closet size ones. I've got your like standard 10 by 10 or 10 by 12s. And then I've got some good RV stuff. What, what are, other than the, the PMS and of course I should be using radius, right. To see where I can expand my business, but like, what what other tech is out there that I should even be aware of, or is there nothing else, not much else to to be aware of? Yeah, you know, and we can go into like access or security and anything that you. Yeah, if think I was is- if I was uh, if I was managed, so if I were let's just say Nate's trying to think through how other ways to uh, to create value for yourself, you know, there there do some very simple like. Uh, sensors within the unit itself that text mm-hmm. the, you can put like a, a motion detector sensor that you say, you know, as a self storage owner, um, you know, you can sell that service to your renter such that if anybody opens the door and there's movement within the unit, like they get a text, which is just like a further, oh. further upsell for the owner, but ultimately a service that at, at, you know, they can make their own decision where they want it that the tenant can take. And, you know, maybe that's, if that's another three or four or five, six bucks per unit per month, like that's real value. Yeah. That's real value. Divide that by a five cap or a six cap or a seven cap. That's real value. Um, You know, uh, I don't think they exist in the right ecosystem today, but like, you know, Bluetooth locks, like an actual lock that, uh, just has Bluetooth capability that goes on a normal door. Isn't like, that like Noki? Noki does that, right? Noki has locks that are installed into the door. Which, if you think about, um, I don't know, it's an extraordinarily high cost to mm-hmm. install a lock into the door. Um, and I don't know about that. There's a, there's much of a, you know benefit to doing that because the other thing is is that if you're you know as you know when you sign somebody up for a unit for the first time they buy a lock from you like so if all of a sudden the lock is a bluetooth lock that never comes out uh now all of a sudden you're not getting lock revenue so there's there's downstream implications for thinking about what tech you implement uh that i don't think that the operator the op that the that the tech companies are lock companies have thought through that Mm -hmm. you know if noki tries to pitch you on this they're going to try and pitch you that you can get way much more per unit well that's that's a very very difficult thing to prove and quite frankly like you have to uh justify it enough and prove it enough to because every person that moves in is buying a twenty dollar thirty dollar lock so that's real revenue that you're you're missing out on so um you know, things like that haven't been solved correctly because there are PTI has some Bluetooth locks that are physical mm-hmm, locks, mm-hmm. but you have yeah. to have a separate app to operate it, which is just a clunky implementation, right? No one's yeah. thought through the ecosystem of how things should actually flow to where you should be able to integrate it either with, uh, you know, some sort of existing platform that already some, some, you know, no one's going to where you don't have to download one app just to use the lock. You know, there's some other way. There's got to be a different implementation. There is a way I actually, as you're, you're speaking about this, I I think I know of uh, someone who's written a protocol that could work for this, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to give it out over the air. I'm going to hold that one. All right. (laughs) Hold that in. Next, it'll be Nate's, Nate's ways, uh, (laughs) podcast about his Bluetooth lock company. (laughs) <laughs> All right. You know what, uh, Corey, we're about to have some fun here. Um, I'm going to do something I've never done before. This is a segment. This is a brand new segment. It's called yeah. Hot or Not. And I'm going to share my screen. And I've got three storage company brands, names and designs. And I want you to give me uh, your honest opinion if they're hot or not. All right. 
these right. are existing but, self storage brands or no, potential? no, no, no. So I told you I bought, you know, I bought a storage facility and these were all on the table as things I was going to go with. First one here, big ass storage, hot or not. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's very funny. So uh, yeah, hot. I'll do that. All right. Llama Rama storage. No, nah. <laughs> You're not into the, the, the gradient color scheme here? It's not the color scheme, although I do think blue serves better because it's a cooler, uh, you know, consumers like to like it more, but mm-hmm. the llama just doesn't do it for me. All right, last one here. Happy Hippo storage. Happy Hippo. See, I like the, I like the blue. The, I like the blue. What, so the the feedback I've gotten from the industry is that having something about like security is one of the biggest um, one of the biggest worries of a tenant. So having mm-hmm. secure some sort of uh, security element within your name uh, resonates well with owners. Got it. So that's why I'd, I'd say I like. What was the first one? Uh, big ass, big ass storage with the with the donkey, and the, and it had a badge. It was like a security badge behind the the donkey. Big ass storage, like I find that to be funny. <laughs> I think uh, if you're a fifty year old woman and you have to tell somebody like what storage facility you're in, and you tell them I'm in the big ass <laughs> self storage facility down the road. <laughs> Now I'm going to tell you right now. I, I I did bite that branding off of someone else. Uh, there's a company out of Columbia, Tennessee, and they produce what's called big ass fans, and they make fans for industrial warehousing, and it's all part yeah, of their and marketing. They put them in hangers kind of, as well, and it's yeah. hilarious. And their marketing is great yeah, because no, they like publish their hate thinking mail. Thinking about uh, the security element as you think mm-hmm. about your name, so reframe yeah. your thought process around that. Yeah, well, we went with something much more. Uh, a little, little bit even keen and uh, easier to understand than one of those concepts. All right, let's jump to my favorite segment of the show. It's called For the Future. For the Future is when I get to ask each guest who comes in a show to give their best predictions based on the following four questions. Corey, are you ready to play? Let's go. All right. First one here. What does DXD Capital look like one year from now? DXD Capital... We'll have um, today. We have three facilities that are open and operating. In a year from now, we will have um, twelve that are operating. We'll have eight to ten that are under construction, and we'll have another fifteen to twenty that are in the pipeline behind it. We will have raised um, two hundred fifty million dollars in total at that point. And, um, yeah, we'll be probably 35 people and, um, starting to consider what to do around some of our, you know, bigger assets that have stabilized and whether we roll those into another fund or not. And yeah, a lot of interesting decisions to be made in the year. Very cool. Number two, any chance we'll see a flat line or negative growth of storage facilities in the U S over the next five, 10 years. And why? Of the actual storage facilities, number of facilities. Yeah. No chance. No chance. It's such a fragmented market. People, you know, the, the demand continues to grow pretty rapidly. Um, in order to see a decline, you know, they'd have to get burned down. Um, You know, people (laughs) store junk in there and they never move it out. So like, unless a stealth storage facility gets hit by a hurricane, get wiped out by a tornado, like it's generally a cash flowing asset for a very long time. So um, it's hard to imagine where, uh, you know, I'd say at least a thousand of these are built per year. There's call it 55,000 of them. You know, that'd be a lot of destruction of a lot of storage in order to see that go down. Let's hope not. Yeah. Number three here. What's one industry trend you think will continue, but you wish would go away? 
uh, people that don't specialize in stores development, office developers, um, uh, retail developers coming to the industry and, uh, you know, picking up storage for the first time and just trying to build it. There's a lot of mistakes that are made, a lot of people that blow themselves up, but that's not going to change. Unfortunately, that's that's part of the industry. That's how you learn sometimes, though. Yeah, by going bankrupt. <laughs> All right, last one here on For the Future. What's one thing you believe will dramatically change or fade away, and we'll say in the self-storage industry as a result of tech advances? One thing that I think will fade fade away? Mm-hmm. Uh, physically signing a lease which mm. happens more than you think it would it's so simple you just on your yeah, phone di- or digital type leases are uh, are penetrating the market but you'd be surprised that how many mom and pops still have physical leases yeah I was very concerned when we uh, acquired in, in a, a like a tertiary, tertiary market. Uh, that I, I was like, no one's going to use this digital tool stuff. This is going to be, and, and actually everyone did. Everyone, yeah. everyone, I, I got one check a month. That's it. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. I don't think credit cards are, I don't think cash and other physical checks. I mean, that's on the decline, I guess, but yeah, still yeah. a lot of people use, use them. All right, Corey, we're going to move to the last three questions. These are actually about you. So our listeners get to know you just a bit better. First one, what are you reading? Uh, I am never split the difference as something that I'm constantly reading and rereading. Chris Voss. Yeah. It's killer. Um, Jay, you know, I'm reading for the first time and I don't read a lot of books. I'm reading uh, Atomic Habits by James Clare. You know, I haven't very, gotten to that one. I'm, I'm very it? late to the definitely. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it helps frame uh, structural ways that you can have better habits. Um, hmm. You know, real implementation and, and more of the psychological aspects of why we do or don't do things. I've enjoyed it so far. All right, number two. Who are you learning from? I learn a lot from the employees that work for me uh, in terms of the specific specific trades that they do and the things that need to get accomplished um, as it relates to building these things. Um, So that's an area where I may be able to analyze where the best ones should go. But in Mm -hmm. terms of like understanding the nuances of the civil engineering, the electrical engineering, and construction trades. Um, I'm learning a lot internally about the specifics of how it goes from conceptual phase to finished product. Got it. All right, last one here. What inspires you? Uh, what inspires me? Uh, I would say I'm inspired... Uh, to continually um, improve through the you know the the kind of the one percent better every day concept mm-hmm. under the basis of like you know when you, I'm a father of a five seven five and three year old and uh, oh wow I don't know that that's as much of inspiration but it's it's I'm in I'm motivated as a father to um, be 1% better every day. So that, I think that, that when I think about their future, that inspires me to be as best as I can because they're going to inherit, inherit uh, characteristics um, and the behaviors that I exhibit to them. So that's very cool. Be better. Corey, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, fun, appreciate man. you breaking things down. I I love the fact that we got to kind of cover the tech and the 
the real side of uh, real estate here, uh, especially your your vantage point as a founder on you know kind of those two sides, I think is you know super insightful. Uh, before we go, uh, for those who want to get in touch with you, maybe they want to learn more about DXD Capital or Radius Plus. Where do they go and how do they do that? Yep, I uh, I'm on the Twitter handle Storage Data Dev. Um, you can get us uh, if you want to reach out to DXD Capital. Um, uh, it's uh, www.dxd.capital. There's no .com or anything else. And then I'm on you know LinkedIn, but uh, between those different avenues, um, always happy to answer questions about storage and uh, whether it be startups, entrepreneurship, anything else. I'm I'm out there. So if someone has a question, reach out. Awesome. Appreciate your time. Um, I don't think I'm getting up to Connecticut anytime soon, but well, we're going to have to connect because it sounds like we need to be pushing rates at your facility more. <laughs> I know, I know. Maybe we can meet halfway. We'll, we'll we'll go and meet in Wisconsin. How's that? Sounds good. <laughs> All right, we'll see you later. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for listening to TechNest, the Prop Tech Podcast. Find all the links and resources mentioned in this episode on technest.io. You can get future episodes delivered to your ears directly by subscribing to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all other major podcast apps. Follow TechNest on social media to stay up to speed on new developments, resources, and announcements in PropTech. <laughs> Your support is greatly appreciated. There's two ways you can directly support this podcast. Share episodes you find interesting and then leave a review of the show in the App Store. From Nate and the TechNest team, thanks for listening.